Everyone, welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi, and I'm exposing you to the intellectual side of Christian belief. We have a, a special episode for you today. It's a Christmas episode, as you can kind of tell. This is like the only Christmas sweater that I own. But we're talking today with a biblical scholar. His name is Dr. Michael Heiser about his controversial view that Jesus was not born on December 25th. And so the question is, when was he born? And that's what we'll be discussing today. So if you want to learn new exciting things about the Bible and about Christianity and see intelligent conversations between Christians and non-Christians, make sure to subscribe to my channel and turn on the little bell so you don't miss any new videos. Before we get into the interview, just a quick reminder that I support my wife and two very young children through this ministry. So if you find any of the work that I do valuable, please consider supporting me on a monthly basis. At $5 a month, you can get early access to all of my content and gain access to a private Facebook group called the Bereans. The link to support me and my family is in the description of the video. It's also, the link is patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. All right, well, let's get into the interview. I'm gonna pull up my little screen here so we can see Dr. Michael Heiser here. And let me just go ahead and introduce you real quickly. So Dr. Michael Heiser, he's a scholar in the fields of biblical studies and the ancient Near East. His dissertation was entitled The Divine Council in Late Canonical and Non-Canonical Second Temple Jewish Literature. It's a mouthful. He's probably most well known for his book, The Unseen Realm, in which he provides a scholarly yet accessible treatment of his view on demons and angelic beings in the Bible. He's also the co-host of a podcast called The Naked Bible, which aims to connect the average Christian with scholarly views on the Bible. It's actually one of my favorite podcasts that, that I listen to. So make sure to subscribe, look for it on anything that you listen to podcast content on. iTunes, Spotify, it's on everything. The Naked Bible. Make sure to subscribe. And uh, Dr. Michael Heiser also has dozens of years of classroom teaching experience and is currently a scholar in residence at Logos Bible Software, which is a company that produces digital resources for studying the ancient world and biblical studies. Well, Dr. Heiser, it's great to have you on Capturing Christianity. So thank you for taking the time to do this. I know that you're like literally in the middle of moving. So you're, I, uh, you said I, like in, in a week, you're about to have all of your stuff out of your house. And like, yeah, you know. I, I do not have a Christmas sweater. <laughs> Uh, most everything I have is in boxes somewhere, stacked up all over the house. Yeah, we're we're all, we're headed to Florida. So, one uh, one correction on the intro: I'm I'm no longer with uh, Logos. This is the reason oh, okay. why, why we're moving. I'm I'm now my lofty title is now the executive director of the Awakening School of Theology and Ministry in Jacksonville, Florida. It's through a a, a large church network of churches we're, we're starting a two-year two-year program really in biblical theology and what i like to call uh, postmodern apologetics uh, that we will be teaching through their school it, it'll it's offered you know a distance as well so really all over the world so that's that's why we're moving and why we are mostly in boxes right now <laughs> Well, we only have you for a little while, so I'm gonna get I'm gonna jump right in. Sure. Okay, we're talking about a podcast episode that you recorded on the Naked Bible, mm -hmm. and uh, before that, let me just ask you a backup or like a, a background question. Mm -hmm. There's there's one of the things that you've done on your website that has had a real profound impact on me, which is a distinction that you make between reading the Bible and studying the Bible. So, how long would you say that you've been a student? You've been studying the Bible. Oh boy, I would say. Yeah, I became a Christian when I was in high school, which I'm 56 now, so maybe 16, 40 years. I've probably been a student for a good 35, <laughs> 35 years. So um, when I, I didn't consciously think, okay, it's time to go from reading the Bible to studying the Bible, but looking back on it, yeah, that, that's basically what I did. Gotcha. All right. Well, in one in episode 138 of your podcast, you explain at length why you don't think that Jesus was born on December 25th. Mm -hmm. and by the way, if you guys want to listen to that episode, I have it linked in the description of this video. So just look down and you can find it real easily. So what got you interested in this particular question? Because there's a lot of different questions about the Bible, but this one yeah. in particular. You know, I, I don't I don't know that it's really odd. You know, it's like a lot of other things that I do um, for the first two or three, almost three centuries of the of the church, nobody celebrated Jesus' birth on any date. So I can't say that this is controversial. If we had a, a first century person here, he'd probably just give you a blank stare like, who cares? <laughs> um, but 
you know, for various reasons, the uh, the birth of Jesus became associated with December 25th. I do not think those reasons are pagan. I did a different episode on the podcast about why Christmas is not a pagan holiday. Uh, basically, uh, to, to wipe that off the table here, the, the whole issue of the birth of, of Jesus associated with December 25th was the result of math. They were really obsessed in the first few centuries with the date of Easter. That was a huge deal. That was the defining moment of, of Christianity, not the birth, but the resurrection. And so some people sort of retroverted, you know, did the math backwards, and then there was a big fight over, you know, when the, the birth was, and you still have it today. Most Christians say December 25th. Eastern Orthodox has it in January, still to this day. Okay, so but for the first three centuries, nobody was was even into it. I I don't find uh, either of those views really satisfactory. Part of the reason is because the early church didn't land in, in, on any of these positions, and you will get early church, uh, early church, and really you know very very ancient writers that situated the death of Herod differently than the majority view does today. That was one thing that sort of tipped me off that, you know, the, the typical chronology as an academic was Jesus was born in 6 BC, but then you have to explain why Jesus is born before Christ. <laughs> and, and again, yeah. this is a result of all modern calendrical calculations. But if you move the date of Herod forward, then you have a big problem with that, with the, what, we'll, what we'll call the consensus view. And I also came across some research that actually took Revelation 12, you know, this is going to sound odd, but but basically saying, let's just read it as though it means what it says. That John is looking up in the sky and he sees certain signage in the sky. And if you plug that into an astronomy program, that produces a certain date for the birth of the Christ child, which is the subject of Revelation 12. That was, I, found, I found was really interesting. But the thing that sort of tipped me over was Paul's statement in Romans 10. Uh, which I, I think I should probably just read for your audience. This is the chapter where Paul's explaining or, or trying to get people motivated to preach the gospel to the, yeah. to the hinterlands. As I was listening to your podcast, that was something that really stuck out to me, is that you, you point out toward the end of Romans yeah. 10, is that there's something that goes on there that's, that's really weird. It's really so, yeah. unexpected. you know. So that, so Paul in Romans 10, 14 says, How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Okay, so you're, you're thinking, well, yes, yeah, we need to get out there because they haven't heard. And then in verse 18, Paul says, but I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. And you go, what? <laughs> like, like, wait a minute. That's not the answer I'm supposed to get there. He yeah, says, it sounds like he's have. trying to like give you a setup for like go out yeah. into the earth and evangelize. Exactly. You know, and so then he quotes Psalm 19 as a proof text that they've heard. It says, for their voice, and he's quoting the Septuagint there, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, their voice has gone out to all the earth, their words to the end of the world. And if you go back to Psalm 19, the Masoretic text is a little bit different. It says their line goes out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. But that's verse 4, Psalm 19, 4. The first three verses are, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Listen to the verbs of communication. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, there are no words, whose voice is not heard. Their line goes out throughout all the earth. You know, And so this is Paul's proof text that, yeah, people should know about this. They, they, they know about this. Now, he doesn't mean the gospel. There have been, you know... Some evangelicals, like D. James Kennedy is the one probably everybody knows. He has a whole sermon, a whole book on, on how you can get the gospel. The Romans wrote essentially from looking at the, the stars and the heavens and the, and the constellations and the zodiac. I don't believe that. And it, because if they could do that, then Paul, why doesn't Paul just say, well, our work here is done. Forget the Great Commission. It's all done. Two thumbs up. Let's go You know, do something else. But he doesn't, obviously. So my view is that what Paul's getting at in Romans 10 is that everybody in in the known world had a chance to know that a divine king had been born. It's something short of the whole Romans road. But he's telegraphing something. The stars, what's going on in the heavens, informed people about the coming of Jesus. And when I sort of realized that, I thought, 
there's really something going on here. <clears throat> and and is, I this, suspect, is this how you segued into Re Revelation 12? Yep. I suspect that what Paul was thinking was what John wrote in Revelation 12. I can't really prove that that is specifically what was in Paul's head. But it, since it appears in the book of Revelation, and it, you know, written by the Apostle John, it, it, it had to have been a tradition in the early church, first century, that these were the circumstances in the heavens of the birth of the Messiah. And again, if you take it for what it says, and there's, I mean, I know now, I mean, this is going back years, I know now that there's a whole genre of what we would call in academia astral prophecy, and all ancient cultures thought what was going on in the heavens would, you know, telegraph what the gods were doing, and, and things that would play out on earth, you know, sort of foreshadowings and forebodings and all that. The Israelites had their own version of this that was monotheistic. The Christians had their own version of this. You know, early Ju Judaism, Second Temple Judaism had their own version of this that was, it wasn't polytheistic. And it wasn't, it wasn't the modern idea of, of astrology that the stars dictate individual destiny. Only God dictates destiny. So, the, you know, if you believe, any, if you believe anything but God is in charge of, of the course of history, you're a heretic, and rightly so, I think. But what they did believe was that the heavens did communicate what God was up to and, and things that, that God was sort of telegraphing, again, foreshadowing. And so when you go back and you put Revelation 12 into an astronomy program, what you get is you get a, a specific date for the birth of Jesus. Basically, you have a 90-minute window when all of the circumstances and you know are, are present that are in Revelation 12. And there are some things that are not listed in Revelation 12 that are present when you plug those the things that are mentioned into an astronomy program. Do you but, have <clears throat> yeah. Do you have Revelation 12 that you can yeah. read for the audience sure. real quick just so they can get a some Yeah, context? Revelation 12 says this, the first this is the first few verses. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child. And, and here this, this tells you who the child is. One who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. It's a quotation of the psalm, messianic psalm. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. It's a reference to the resurrection and the ascension. And the woman, who is Israel, fled into the wilderness. And there she has a place prepared by God in which she's to be nourished for 1260 days. You know, when, when, you, when you take it, okay, I'm going to just assume that John actually means what he says. This is, this is astral stuff, celestial signs. And we accept this idea with the second coming all the time. We accept it with the star of the Magi all the time. But when you go to Revelation 12 and, and try to get people to read it that, oh, that's just weird stuff. Well, why is it, what about signs of the sky at, at Pentecost or the, the coming of the Son of Man? Or, you know, then it's okay, but, but we can't do it with Revelation 12. Why not, is my question. Why yeah, not? Yeah, and so, and so basically what you've done, though, and if I can just try to summarize what you what this is all based on is that it basically in Revelation 10, there's a reason why people that haven't been uh, preached to could know about Jesus. And then second, yeah, there's a passage Romans in 10. Revelation, uh, yeah. Romans 10. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And then yeah, uh, I, and then the passage in Revelation 12 describes the birth of Jesus in astronomical terms. And right. then from those terms, we get, like you said, about a 90 minute window where yeah. all of these astronomical all clues and point I'll to just the same. Give your, I'll give your audience the, the short grocery list. Okay, the woman is Virgo. There's only one woman constellation. The moon is somewhere under her feet. The terminology is not precise. The sun, pre precise. The sun is in her midst, which is sort of classic astronomical terminology for the sun being in a constellation. So, the sun is going to be, you know, in in Virgo somewhere, and, and it's the midsection. Uh, the the dragon. You know, at at the woman's feet, waiting to devour the child. There, it depends on how you take Paul's statement in in, in Romans ten eighteen. He's quoting the, the the Septuagint or the MT. It doesn't. It's kind of six of one and a half dozen of another. But if the MT, the Masoretic text, is right, their line, if if that's how we should read it, 
then that is, is going to be a reference to the ecliptic. The ecliptic is an imaginary line that the constellations follow in the course of every year. Well, there's a there's what in the ancient world was a serpentine constellation right underneath the woman. Okay, it, it was it was a combination of the Scorpion and Libra. In the ancient world, they were viewed as one, and the and Libra would have been the pinchers. Off to the side is Hydra, which is the dragon. So either way, there, there's a there's a there's a dragon underneath the woman. Okay, so you put all those things together. You, those are the things that are mentioned in Revelation 12. I think not coincidentally, the constellation above Virgo is Leo. It's the Lion of Judah inside leo on the date that you get and, and then the date we might as well not keep it a mystery here the date is september 11th in 3 bc okay if you take that date then there's a conjunction of regulus which is the the king's star the star that was associated in the ancient world with the birth of a divine king and it's exactly co-joined to jupiter which was the king planet because it's the biggest one again the same the same signage so all of these things together, there's a 90-minute window when they're, when they're all there. And that date is September 11, 3 BC. That date also coincides on the Jewish calendar with Tishri 1, which in the Old Testament was the date of the inauguration of the Davidic king. <laughs> okay? So, I mean, you start to see some of these things concatenate. And, you know, it even goes deeper than that because in Jewish tradition, Tishri 1 was the birth of Noah. Okay, so Jesus, the Messiah and Noah, Jesus and Noah would have shared a birthday. And that's important for the symbology related to the reversal of, of what happens in Genesis 6. You know, because the, the Messiah is supposed to reverse all the, the supernatural and human rebellions in, in, in biblical theology. There's Genesis 3, there's Genesis 6, there's what happened at Babel. You know, there, these things ripple out uh, in, in a number of respects. Um, so I want where, to pick up on... Yeah, go. You, you can jump in, you know wherever you want. I mean, the big problem with this that people, you know, pick at is, well, we know when Herod died and Herod yeah. died for sure in 4 BC. No, I, we actually don't. There's actually a very good scholarly argument for Herod's death in 1 BC. And a guy can give your audience the sources if they want to go read, uh, you know, some of these things, but I'll go ahead and please jump in. This is, this is your, <laughs> your show. I don't no. Know. Yeah. I was, uh, <laughs> I was going to pick up on Herod later, and maybe we can actually go into some of those reasons. But I wanted to touch on something that in your podcast you talk about September 11th and how it has this sort of, in your view, as a supernaturalist, it has this kind of cosmic significance. And so I wanted to ask you about that. What What do you mean by this sort of cosmic significance? Do you think September yeah. 11th, something's going on with that? Well, I, I think I think it's for us now, just, you know, for, for us now, it, it it's taken on that that impact. I mean, in the ancient world, when Jesus is born, I mean, or in the first few centuries, September 11th isn't going to mean anything. Tishri 1 is going to mean a lot. That's going to be huge. And when, and when Tishri 1 to the Jew, that, okay, the Davidic king is born, you know, the, the, you know, the, the new Noah, just like he's the new Moses and the new Joshua and the new David. Now we get the new Noah, you know, all these, all, all these, again, important figures from Old Testament, both historically and theologically. Uh, especially again when we're talking about re reversals of of cosmic rebellion, uh, supernatural rebellion in 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 the Old Testament, really. It, if you ask the average again Jew, why is the world such a mess? You know, his answer is going to be different than if you ask the average Christian today. Why is the world such a mess? The average Christian, oh, Genesis three, the fall. A Jew would not give you that answer. A Jew would say, well, there's actually three reasons why the world is so, such a mess. Genesis 3 is one of them, but Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is another. Gen and what happened at Babel? Genesis you know, 11, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. So they, they viewed the chaos of the world as due to three events okay, that are primeval, Genesis 1 through 11, before the birth of Abraham. And so the Messiah is supposed to fix all three of those. Now, we know from what we know in the New Testament about Jesus, the resurrection and the ascension, the coming of the Holy Spirit addresses all of them in different ways. You know, so so the Tishri 1 thing for the uh, an early Jewish Christian would be a big deal, that the date coincides for a Gentile with their own set of astronomical signage about the birth of a divine king. That's a big deal. I mean, it's just hard to miss. So I, I think that's why the date is significant. It, to us, we look at September 11th as being, again, you know, 
you know, because of the the events in New York City, it's it's obvious to those in the West that that's a a big deal. But I'm I'm not a believer that America is the subject of biblical prophecy. Now I I wonder, you know, and, and this is all it is. I wonder if if we won't look back on it in a hundred years, and think thoughts like, you know, this was this had a bigger, most more damaging effect to the church in the West and maybe the rise of Islam or something mm. like that. But, but today, I don't know that we can necessarily say that. I mean, the, the, the questions are a lot more complicated. We don't, we don't have the perspective yet as far as what's going to extend uh, from this date. Will, will, will this date have led to tyranny in the West? I don't know, maybe. You know, but, but again, I don't think biblical prophecy is about modern america or or modern western civilization i think it's bigger than that i mean we're certainly included we and we certainly played a role providentially uh in in god's use of of people you know to accomplish the great commission but he doesn't need us to accomplish the great commission he doesn't need america to do that god will use whatever means that he he wants to use and he's going just going to do that so we lack the perspective at this point but in the ancient world the date would have been significant to both Jew and Gentile. All right, well, let's move to, uh, I'm gonna hit live Q&A a little bit early today. And so if you have a question for Dr. Heiser, ask it in the live chat. We have some rules posted over this side, actually. So uh, I'll just read them out. So ask your questions in the live chat, one question per person. Make sure to tag at Capturing Christianity so that I can see them. Please make sure that your question is on topic and super chat questions are bumped to the top automatically. So if you wanna make sure that your question is asked, Super chats are the way to do that. Oh, and also thank you if you decide to do that. Okay, uh, well, let's. I have one question here that's not a, a necessarily a question, but Centennial Apologetics asks, get Heiser to touch on the Qumran calendar dating and how they predicted the Messiah to arrive within oh, yeah. a window of 10 BC to 2 BC. Yeah, there there are lots of, of ancient Jewish applications or or let's let's just, I guess exegesis is the right word. Um, of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. The Sadducees had one view. The Pharisees had one. The, the Essenes or whoever you know lived at Qumran had another. The Qumran system is the only one that has a, a wide enough window, basically, um, you know, 10 BC on into you know, like 1 BC or a little bit, little bit after, in which the Messiah would be born to, in fulfillment of Daniel 9. And the reason why there, there's a, the reason why they landed in the right place and there's this variance of years is, is quite complicated. Basically, the, the Essenes used a, a mathematically precise, perfect calendar. Uh, they did not use an astronomically strict calendar. This is actually the reason why they left the, the temple in Jerusalem and went out in the desert and pretended to have a temple and go through, you know, rituals, even though they're just out living there among the tumbleweeds. Okay, they they viewed their calendar. They they believe reflected the perfect mind of God, and, and this was their calendar: four quadrants of ninety days. That's three hundred and sixty plus one day in between. That's three sixty four. Three hundred and sixty four day calendar. If you start the calendar on day four of Genesis, it's perfect. Every Sabbath is on the same day every year. Every Jewish festival is on the same day every year. Every Passover, same time, every year. Whereas even now, even today in Judaism, there every once in a while you got to throw in a thirteenth month, you know, to get Passover to line up, you know, correctly with the the Jewish calendar and, and whatnot. So the Essenes looked at, at this going on, saying, you, "Your calendar is contrived. It's a human calendar. Why aren't you using the, the calendar of God here? You know, it starts on on the fourth day, and then you you, you know you you just." go with the the even numbers and everything works perfectly every year, year in, year out. There's no variation. It's mathematical perfection. Well, if you adopt that calendar, then, you know, that's one thing. And then you have to decide, is the Jubilee the 49th or the 50th year? So that's why there's this, you know, 10 year, you know, window variance, but they were, theirs was the only system applying all of that to Daniel 9, 24 through 27 that got the Messiah, Jesus born in the correct window. So that, that's what he's talking about. That's a real so, quick and dirty overview of that. But. Yeah. All right. So um, before we get to the next question, I want to remind you guys, if you have a question for Dr. Heiser related to the date of Jesus's birth, 
then make sure to tag at Capturing Christianity. That way I can see it and just ask anything that's on topic. And so by, I had a... Way, yeah, I, go ahead. I, I, I should say, if people want to, to read about that, Roger Beckwith's article, it's B-E-C-K-W-I-T-H, has an article on Daniel 9 and the calendar system. Nice. All right. So uh, here's one from Nathan Frank Hauser. Ask Dr. Heiser for a short source list for our further study. Yeah, I think the important articles would be uh, Andrew Steinman. That's S-T-E-I-N-M-A-N-N. -N. Andrew Steinman, When Did Herod the Great Reign? This is a, a recent article, fairly recent, 2009. Uh, Novum Testamentum, 51. That's a scholarly journal. Uh, it, you know, I don't know if it's going to be available on the internet or not, but if you're near a, a research library that has the JSTOR database, you'll get it. Uh, W.E. Filmer has an article that, that's real important. Um, let me see if I can get a reference. Uh, I don't know if... Let me see here quickly. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to pull that. Well, no, wait, maybe I, no, I can't. I don't have my flash drive in. No uh, anyway, W.E. Filmer, has, look, use Google Scholar, F-I-L-M-E-R, and something about Herod's death or, or something like that, and you'll get it. Um, Ormond Edwards has a, an article that's important on Herodian coins. Um, I'm trying to remember what it's called. Uh, just put in Herod chronology uh, with uh, Edwards in it, and you'll find it. There, there are four or five uh, significant articles. This I, this one I know is free. If you go to, uh, if you use Google, and you go to, let me get the reference here. Or my Adobe Reader's just dying here. Let me try to bring this up again. It's R.C. Young's uh, website here. No, oh, it won't open. Well. Uh, put in, use Google again, R.C. Young, um, let's see here, Death of Herod, When Did Herod Rule, something like that. Uh, he just read this, a paper at the last uh, Near East Archaeological Society meeting in San Diego last November, and he put it on online for free. He put his slides in PDF form. It's excellent. It basically goes through the, uh, the, five, the four or five pillars of the consensus view about Herod dying in 4 BC and shows you what the, this view depends on. It has three or four pillars and then destroys them all. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he just shows again why none of the pillars are correct. And if even one of them is incorrect, the whole system falls, but he, he destroys them all. So this is a minority view in scholarship. Uh, it's not new to me. I didn't come up with it. But those are those are some you know off the top of my head, you know scholarly works that people can can consult. You could probably Google my website, drmsh.com, and put in Herod, death, Jesus birth, or something like that, and you may find the references there. Um, other than that, I could probably I could just send you a short list too, since my my PDF. Yeah, while we're doing resources working. and stuff, yeah, if you could just yeah. uh, email me afterwards and, and give me some, that would be perfect. All right, so next question is from Timothy Holman. He says, how do we know that John in Revelation is talking about a literal date and not just making a theological point? Matthew seems to change his genealogy to get 14 times 3. Well, John doesn't, give us, John doesn't give us a genealogy, nor does he give us an actual date. He gives us a description of the sky. So I don't know if that affects uh, the, the question or not. So we're not... John isn't doing anything like Matthew's doing because he doesn't give us a genealogy. So I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that helps or hurts or. I don't know where to go with it, with it. You know, beyond that, I mean, basically, I like like I said, I, it, I'm just taking John for what he says. I looked up in the sky and saw. You know that that he the the, the book has these references in them, and I think it's beyond coincidence, of the results that it produces. If you just take him at it, you know, at face value and plug it in. Right. All right. Next question is from, and I'm pulling it up on my screen here. It looks like his name is 
Brian Hill. He says, what is, this, what is the significance of knowing this information? Is it to verify the reliability of the biblical prophecy? No, I mean, you don't, you don't need to, you know, certainly you, you don't need this to take the, the biblical prophecy seriously. There are interesting things that sort of play out uh, chronologically in, in the life of Jesus in other regards. For instance, if, you're, if you adopt these dates in Luke 4, when Jesus goes into the synagogue at Nazareth and quotes Isaiah 61 about the Jubilee year, it's a Jubilee year. Okay. You know, there are just other things that, that it helps kind of fall in place um, chronologically. But I think, I think really it's about the messaging of the birth. If you go back into the birth narratives and some of the things that are said, if you are reading them as someone who is believing that Jesus was born on a particular day with, with a set of signage, then there are going to be things in certain passages that just have a bigger punch but you don't need them to affirm the historicity of the date. All right, next question is from Chris Pants, I think is the way. I, I don't know if that's uh, French. Just joined live. the live stream. Question is, why would the birth of Christ be recorded in Revelation 12 as opposed to the Gospels? I wonder if it would be included after the event. Well, it's, it's because of Revelation cycling through... Oh, Revelation cycles through lots of things. I mean, it, you know, Revelation chapter 12 is about, it's about more than the birth, but Revelation is concerned to, to connect events in heaven with events on earth. And especially if you read it cyclically, that there are things that are happening on earth, both in in the, in the near past and also in the present and also in the future that, you know, John is, is connecting these things with the spiritual world, which again, occasionally for John means what's going on in the heavens. You have to realize that, that when they thought of, of the, the spiritual world, they kind of like us, they thought of it as up there. All right. Mm -hmm. We still, we still talk this way because of, of, biblical statements about where God is, okay, in the heavens. Well, they they did that as well, but they viewed the stars and the, the sun and the moon and all this stuff as, as being part of God's either heavenly host. Just think about the term heavenly host, okay? Uh, the stars fighting from their courses in Judges, you know, chapter 5. I mean, the, the Old Testament is filled with astral language for supernatural beings, the beings of the heavenly host. And so it was very normal for them to associate things that they saw in the heavens with divine activity. And so since John is, is, is making an effort to connect heaven and earth, both past, present, and future, the birth of the Messiah along with the death and the resurrection, they're all in the same passage, Revelation 12. It's not just about the birth. But those are significant events. And so that that's why John is doing it. He's Of course, we have birth narratives uh, in, in Matthew and Luke. And by the way, the, the star of Bethlehem fits very well into this system. Remember I mentioned Jupiter, the king planet. I accept what most astronomers think explains the motion of the star and that as the retrograde activity of Jupiter. Well, Jupiter's in the picture in Revelation 12. It's not mentioned in Revelation 12, but again, if you plot it out, there it is in conjunction with you know, Regulus, the king's star. So it, it's there. It works just fine. Uh, if you wanted to sort of read like a, a a book that encompasses lots of other things associated with this topic and, and events in Jesus' life, uh, I, I do recommend um, The Star That Astonished the World by uh, Martin. Um, I don't buy, uh, you know, several things that Martin says theologically in other books, but I find this this book pretty compelling. Um, you know, so that would be a good sort of introduction to a lot of it. All right, let's get to the next question here. Let me pull it up on the screen. Sorry, guys, I'm, I'm doing a new format today, and it's taken a lot of work in the background to display these on the screen. So hopefully you guys are benefiting. All right, let me pull up my, my notes here. So, so from Jorge Anito, would Dr. Heiser see oddities, setbacks of, of the Christmas story, 
long travel to Bethlehem, supposed adultery of Mary, no room in inn, killing of boys, connected to the dragon's attack. Did he say adultery of Mary? <laughs> supposed adultery of Mary. Oh, yeah. the supposed adultery of Mary. Well, I mean, there are other things about about the birth story um, that certainly connect. I, I do think, again, how can I say this and, and have it be quick here? Um, the for again, think think like a gen. Well, I guess you could think like a Jew here too. But but the 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 messaging of the heavens that associated divinity again with the king. You know, there's this whole debate like did, did the Israelites really expect the Messiah to be divine? I mean and I think you can make a good you know Old Testament theological argument for the necessity of that. So if you're thinking along those terms, this would be something that would align really well with that. Um, there there is again the part of the birth narrative about going down to Egypt, which of course mimics the Exodus. I mean none of this mars Jesus' birth and early life. And, and really all the way up through his baptism as a as what scholars like to call a new exodus. There's a lot about the exodus tradition that maps over to Jesus' life because he is the son of God. Israel was the corporate son of God. Israel is called, God calls Israel, my son, a few times in the Old Testament, one of which is in the exodus narrative. Hosea 11, out of Egypt I have called my son. This is, the, the, again, the passage that Matthew quotes that actually refers to Israel corporately back in Hosea 11.1. 1. Hosea is looking backward. Matthew sees an analogy and uses it of Jesus. So all of that stuff would certainly be what we'd call dragon activity because in Exodus 12, God views the plagues as be a direct attack on the gods of Egypt. This night, you know, Passover, the death of the firstborn, I will have victory over the gods of Egypt. So I take those, you know, those of you who have read Unseen Realm already know this. Uh, the biblical writers believe that the gods of the Old Testament were real. They were real entities. Yes, they attached themselves to idols. Yes, people built idols so that the gods could inhabit them and they could make deals with them and all the, all the ancient Near Eastern religious stuff. But when, when scripture says that Yahweh is the God of all gods, I think it means exactly what it says. He's not the God of cartoon figures. He's not the God of, of beings that we really don't know don't exist. And so we sort of read that with a wink and a nod. No, they're serious about it. And so if you look at it that way, yeah, you know, the circumstances of the birth and the early life certainly play into, again, the new Exodus idea. All right, you next know. question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next question is from Infinite Rome. Please pull up my screen here. Infinite Rome. Hope it's not a stupid question, but is the calendar in ancient times similar or different from today's calendar? I ask this because I assume it's something that could confuse some people. Oh, it's, this is, it's a quagmire. <laughs> I mean, just, just like today, we have different, we use different calendars that start at different points of the year. There's a school calendar, there's a fiscal calendar, there's the, you know, you know, official monthly calendar that's based on astronomy, or at least it was at one point, you know, Julian calendar. So we have multiple calendars. They had multiple calendars. And so, no, they don't all align. Uh, you have to sort of work at what corresponds to what and which one corresponds to which one and which ones you care about and which ones we don't even use those anymore. So who gives a rip? You know, it, it, it's, it's actually quite complicated and in mm -hmm. the ancient world they had the same issue with jewish versus gentile calendars and then you had you know when, when christianity was was legalized and became the official religion of rome it's like you know they switched their calendars you know so it, it it's really quite complicated there's no neat uh well i shouldn't say this there, there's no simple alignment lots of people have devoted their lives to to doing this and working in this area and so you can get you know, a, a good alignment, but to sort of explain why it is what it is, is good, good luck with that. I mean, it may, <laughs> you can quit your job you know, and devote yourself to a calendar alignment. And uh, if somebody pays you for that, I guess that's a good deal, you know. So I have, uh, just to let you guys know, I have plenty of questions in the queue right now. So if you want to make sure that one of your questions is asked, then we'll need to do super chat. So if you don't want to do a super chat for your question, then there's no need to put any more chats in the, or questions in the live chat. So here's the next one. Next uh, question is from Itila 
Nemeth. I don't know how to pronounce that. Is any other ancient religion culture paid attention to this far, this to this star in formation, or was it important, special for them? Yeah, well, you know, the it, just in Greco-Roman religion generally, they're going to associate this like one feature. Let's just take one feature: the conjunction of Jupiter and Regulus. They're going to associate that with the, the divinity of a king, you know, the birth of a king. So that that's an auspicious thing. Um, that that's probably the easiest uh, thing to see as far as what would what would sort of be part of a a non you can't even use the word Christian because this is the birth of Jesus but a non Jewish system uh, that that would have spoken volumes to a Gentile so there there's an example but you know the Magi again d depending on where you think they're from uh, you know Persia Babylon you know some other East whatever that is. Um, and there are a number of options. They're they're just they're a good illustration for how um, people in the ancient world did pay attention to these features, even though they're not themselves Jewish. Uh, they didn't have to be Jewish to to think that that some of these elements were important. Uh, they were associating them, and we can argue as to why. Is was it the influence of Daniel? It was their exposure to to Hebrew scriptures or what? But they they also considered their importance in relationship to Judaism. So Judaism wasn't alone there, but in some of the things, you know, they, they would have been, these, these would have been part of the picture for a long time. All right. So we got a, we did get a super chat from, looks like from Jay Shy, and I'm making sure that it's on the screen here. It should be on the screen. Okay. He says, would you say that ancients believed the natural world is the supernatural is supernatural as well? since they see the stars this way and so on. Yeah, an ancient person would have would have thought of lots of things. Um, you know, as either indicating the presence of a supernatural being or associated associated it with the, you know, domain or province uh, or sphere of authority uh, of of a supernatural being. It's not just the the heavens. Um you know, this is why this is why the Old Testament will associate. Um, the Old Testament actually demythologizes a bit here. It, it was common in, like, well, I'll just use Canaanite religion, uh, and these terms show up in Scripture, which is why I'm going to use them. But Dever, you know, plague, Ketev, you know, famine, Reshef, you know, the warfare, you know, all these, you know, severe natural disaster kind of terms they they canaanites would have assigned each one individually to a specific minor deity the old testament doesn't do that the old testament assigns those things under the province of yahweh but in like habakkuk 3 those deity names ketev dever reshef are in yahweh's retinue and that and that and that's a way of of, of subordinating them to the true god so they don't have their own uh, spheres of authority it's, it's Yahweh who has the authority. So it was a way the Old Testament writer, again, sort of put them in their place uh, and, and, and gave God credit for his you know, control over, over the, the forces of nature. But this is really, it's really common. For those of you who are kind of interested in this topic, if you go to my website, drmsh.com, and go to the FAQ, the last question at the bottom of the FAQ page deals with this. Um, there's a, there's, there's a difference in looking at the natural world and learning what makes the natural world tick and realizing that, you know, a biblical person, whether it's a biblical writer or just somebody living in the first century BC, they, they, they would have been, you know, incorrect to think that these things were actually like divine beings. And so, you know, it, it's easy to look at them as, as metaphors. That's one thing, but when they when they when they're giving us information about the spiritual world, that hey, there are there, the spiritual world actually is is populated. The, the beings there are real. There is in fact a spiritual world that is animate and populated, and and you know there's there's rebellion and there's loyalty and there is spiritual warfare. That like these the, the spiritual world is real. That is something that that we can't sit in judgment on with the tools of science. When the Bible tells us something about the spiritual world, that's revelation. When the Bible tells us something about the natural world, I think you know. I think it's very clear from the, the, the creation mandate in Genesis one 
that God expects and knows that we are going to learn. We're going to subdue the earth and find out what makes it tick. We're going to grow in our knowledge of that. And God expects us to put the, you know, put those things under under the tools of our of discovery. But the spiritual world, by definition, doesn't work that way. It can't be put under a microscope. It can't be detected with the five senses. It is beyond the, the you know, it's beyond science. We can't use the tools of science to sit in judgment on it. Rather, we have to use the, use the tools of logic and coherent thought. Uh, and, and again, I think philosophers, whether they're believers or atheists or whatever, have done a pretty good job of showing the coherence of theism over the last few millennia. So I think, I think we're, we're okay there uh, in showing that the idea of theism and, a, and the, the reality of supernatural beings is a coherent worldview. Um, and I, I, I think that's the biblical you know, worldview. I, I accept the reality of a supernatural world. Um, I, I know that a star is a ball of gas. So that up there, that isn't a supernatural being. But I can understand why they would have thought that because that's in a domain where, where God lives or the gods or whatever. And, and so is the sea and the mountains. And, and you know, these are places that aren't fit for human habitation that humans can't go. They can't live. They're not part of God's ordered world for humanity to live in and on. And so, yeah, you know, that this, they're remote, they're hostile, you know, again, so that they would, they would associate these sorts of natural things with divine activity. And, and, you know, we can look at that and say, okay, we know why thunderstorms come and, and blah, 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 blah. Oh, that's good. That's fine. You know, we understand the biblical people that God picked, God picked these people to write scripture, knowing what they knew and what they didn't know. And if God wanted them to give us science that conforms to a 21st century pool of knowledge, he would have not picked those people back then. He would have picked people now. So the fact that God didn't pick people now, but he picked people then, ought to tell us that God's purpose had nothing to do with communicating scientific knowledge. It must be about communicating something else. And so God lets them use the tools and the language, the symbols, the metaphors, whatever, at their disposal to give us the information that God does want us to have. And that was really smart on God's part. You know why? Because science changes. If you don't tether theology to science, that's a smart thing. Because then theology the theological messaging transcends science. It is true and relevant no matter when you live. You just express it in a different way. So again, I have a, I have a discussion of that in my FAQ um, because when you get into this star talk and how ancient people viewed the world, it, it sounds kind of goofy to us because we're modern. Yeah, there are lots of things in the Bible that sound goofy to us because we're modern. But this is why on, on my podcast and everything I write, what I want people to do is tr read the Bible as though an ancient person read it, you know, and wrote it that way. Because guess what? They did. <laughs> That's the way God set it up. So it doesn't answer your questions. It answered their questions. And it reflects the way they would talk about things, not the way we would talk about things. Yeah, that's a really good point. It, I wish more people were able to to get that. Well, let me let me just it remind will, everyone. It will so open scripture up to you like nothing else, and it, it's hard. It's hard to read the Bible like an ancient person, but lo and behold, these things have their own internal coherence and logic. You 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 will be able to see what in the world they're trying to say, and and you'll be able to follow threads and connect dots. You just will. But it's hard. All right. So we only have time for one more question, and then we're going to close it out because uh, Heiser's got to go and do a lot of other things. And like I mentioned at the yeah. very beginning of this this episode, he's in the middle of moving, and he was just able to squeeze in an hour of his day. So I really, again, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to do sure. this. So here's the last one. It's another super chat from Harley Wikes. It looks like it. I, I don't know if that's a, a guy or girl. Anyways, they ask, what does Daniel mean when he says the wise will shine like stars? Is it the same? Is that the same thing as going to heaven or does it relate to the star of Bethlehem? Uh, you need Google drmsh.com 
and put in the word stars and Abraham and Genesis 15. And you will find an episode of the podcast where I had a guest on, David Burnett. This is the subject of his thesis. And that is the promise in Genesis 15 about the seed of Abraham would be like the stars of heaven. In antiquity, that was not just viewed as a numerical promise. It was a qualitative promise. Stars were viewed as divine beings, and this is a way of communicating the fact that believers, human believers who are members of God's family, will be glorified. They will be like the stars. They will be made divine, like 1 John says, we will be made like Jesus. So that's what Daniel's talking about. It's talking about our glorification and our exaltation to become members of God's family. And again, as I say in Unseen Realm, we are going to be the reconstituted council of God, replacing all the the members of God's council who rebelled, and we get their jobs, and we get their spots in God's house, as it were. All right, and with that, we're going to leave it. So I really appreciate, again, you coming back on, or not back on, this is your first time on the channel, so maybe (laughs) in the future I'll have you back on to discuss something else that's not completely related to just Christmas. Is there anything else that you want to leave my audience with? Any yeah, places I, to go? I, any any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I would encourage you to you know listen to the podcast and you know drmsh.com is the nerve center. Uh, you can find all all the stuff that I'm into there. I mean, I I spend a lot of time in the in the in the fringe internet world, what I affectionately call Christian Middle Earth and just Middle Earth in general, um, trying to help people to think well about Scripture and about Jesus, about primary sources in general. Uh, to do something useful, you know, for for people who are well outside the faith, and maybe you know help them to to be less hostile toward it. So please avail yourselves of that, and of course, you know, have a wonderful Christmas. Have a merry Christmas. Enjoy the day. Doesn't matter if Jesus was born on December twenty fifth or not. <laughs> it is always good uh, to remember the Lord's birth. Well, yeah. So merry Christmas, everybody. Someone mentioned that they wish they could find the sweater. I actually got this as a gift. <laughs> My wife is a blogger, and someone gave her this sweater, and I had to wear it for some picture, and so that's I just threw it on. But anyways, thanks for joining me on this special Christmas episode. Again, subscribe to the channel. Like this video if you enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys around. All right, have a good Christmas. See ya.